Hi everyone, this is Tony with Indianapolis Fitness and Sports Training, and this is my very first post on iPads University. I am really excited to get this started, and I thought I'd have a little bit of fun with it. And I want to just talk a little bit about classifying your athletes, and this is something that uh, we've been talking about at the gym for a little bit, and this is what kind of Ty and I wrote in our book, is that there's got to be a way to start delineating the types of athletes we have in front of us, because we can assume things based on our experience on how an athlete moves and what they need but at the end of the day there's got to be some type of testing in order to kind of weed out exactly what type of athletes in front of you and what they need because observations will only get you so far they're very subjective so getting some uh, hard data behind these testing and behind these classifications just helps narrow in your programming a little bit better and it makes the results you get that much more impressive. So in order to talk about classifying our athletes, we need to start making pools for which our athletes can fit into. Now, this was a struggle with us at the office, but at the end of the day, we started talking about classifying them based on uh, tissue quality, like how their muscles and the tendons develop, because you're gonna have certain neurological adaptations that come first, but ultimately, if that's repeated on this athlete, is that their physiology actually changes to reflect that. How cool is that? So you have these athletes that are either really rigid or really elastic. And we came up with this stiffness scale in order to start pulling our athletes and classifying with what they are really good at and what their limiting factor is. Now, Rigid and elastic is ultimately, a, again, a term for exactly how their muscles and their tendons kind of developed. It's if I have a really rigid muscle, uh, I want to kind of think like a thick rubber band, is that it takes a lot of force to stretch out, but when I release it, it's going to go really, really far compared to a thin rubber band. Or a thinner rubber band or a more elastic rubber band can be pulled back really quickly, they may not go as far as the thick rubber band. So it's just a question of what our athletes need. Is that if I have a rigid athlete in front of me, is that this is an athlete that is focused on total force output. Is that they're that thick rubber band that may take a long time for them to show that force, but when they do, it's quite impressive. Versus a elastic athlete or a thin rubber band, they may not produce as much force as the thick rubber band or the rigid athlete, but they can probably produce whatever force they have really quickly. And rigidity and elasticity are pretty good words, but we thought we can classify it even simpler than that. So what Ty and I came up with was is that if you have a rigid athlete or elastic athlete, or you might have a gorilla or a kangaroo. And a gorilla is just our version of a rigid athlete, is that they have tissues that have adapted over time in order to produce force output. And they might take a while to do so. These are our wrestlers, power lifters, shot putters. On the other hand, we have our kangaroos, and kangaroos are very elastic. They are very springy, they have the ability to transfer force really quickly. And they may, they may not transfer as much force as the gorilla, but they do so with an efficiency because, again, they're that thin rubber band that can snap really quickly. So we have these two athletes in front of us. We have a gorilla and a kangaroo, and they're focused on different things. And what a lot of research has shown is that is if I remove the limiting factor for these athletes, they will ultimately prove in their testable, so such as their vertical jump and their 40 yard dash. So if I have a gorilla who's already going to be proficient in strength training, I might need to impose a time constraint or make them demonstrate their total force output quicker and I'll probably get a greater return on investment than just having them increase their already great force output. And the same can be said for their kangaroo, is that I can't, they're, they can produce things very quickly, but if I can increase the total amount of force that they can produce really quickly, is their uh, performance will hopefully improve. And so what it comes down to is how do you know what athlete you have in front of you? Is do I have a gorilla 
or do I have a kangaroo? Now this is the shameless part of the presentation where I say if you have a velocity based training device such as a gym or a push unit, you could do a low velocity profile and use the athlete performance index number to tell you exactly what type of athlete you have. And that's going to be in Ty and I's book that we released, available on completesportperformance.com. But I realize that not everyone has a gym wear and not everyone has a push unit. So what are some other options you can do? And for that, I dove into the research a little bit and I found the Bosco jump test. Now, the Bosco jump test was invented by Carmelo Bosco. And there's a, actually a variety of these different jump tests, but the one that kind of caught my eye was his version of a static jump versus a counter movement jump. And all it was was that the athlete put their hands on their hips, went on a force plate or just jump mat, and they paused at the bottom, took a four or five second hold, and jumped straight up. Versus using a counter movement jump, hands are still on the hips, they're going down and jumping up as fast as they can. And what happens is there's an equation you would use in order to determine the influence of the stretch shortening cycle has on the jump. So it pretty much determines that my counter movement jump is automatically going to be higher than my static jump, and the research shows that is that no matter what type of athlete I have in front of me, when the stretch shortening cycle is involved with the counter movement jump, it's going to be higher than that static jump. Now the question is, is how much higher? So I can actually measure the percentage gain by taking the counter movement jump, subtracting my static jump, divide by the counter movement jump, and then multiply that by 100, and that gives me the percentage gain that they've gotten from the stretch shortening cycle. Now a more elastic athlete, a kangaroo, is going to have a higher gain from this. Because again, they're that thin rubber band. They can't produce a lot of force, so they rely on the elasticity of the stretch shortening cycle. Versus a gorilla, the gorilla is going to have a more muscular effort. So the static jump and the counter movement jump shouldn't be that much different. And I've performed this test a few times and what we've kind of seen is the 10% mark is usually the dividing line. And this isn't an exact estimate, but I, I, this is, for all intents and purposes, a good starting point that we can use to, again, start pulling our athletes into these categories. So if I have a greater than 10% gain with my counter movement jump, I have a kangaroo. If I have a less than 10% gain, I have a gorilla. And in order to demo this, I actually recruited two of our interns, so we have <laughs> Pedro on the left, and we have Tim on the right. Uh, and Pedro's a wrestler, so he's gonna be our gorilla in this equation, and Tim, our all-around athlete, or as he likes to say, better uh, spike ball player than Pedro, is going to be our kangaroo. And you can tell by looking at these guys that they're built pretty differently, but you know that's my assumption, so now I need to test it to see what categories they go on. Now, at the at IFAST, we do have a just jump mat, so that was the equipment that we used for this. And we used the official Bosco test, you know, hands on hips. But if you don't have this technology, I mean, you can use a Vertec as well. You're going to use some form of arm swing. It won't be as exact, probably, as the just jump mat. But again, there has to be some sort of testing protocol in place. So you need to be able to track your athlete's progress. So using any one of these devices is fine. So I had Tim and Pedro set up for a counter movement jump on the left, and I had him pause at the bottom of the static jump on the right. And there's an exact degree of knee flexion that you'd have to go for the Bosco jump test. And for me, I just wanna make sure that they're in a comfortable position at the bottom of their squat. And when they jump, they're not sinking down initially. So when Tim on the right is at this bottom position, he's gonna jump straight up from that. If I see any dip in his hips, I know that he's essentially cheated, cheated the test and that he's used some form of the stretch running cycle. So I'm gonna try and have him in the lowest possible position where he can jump straight up from that. And what we saw of these guys is with Pedro, if we uh, calculate the difference between his counter movement jump and stag jump, he only had a 7.4% gain from his stretch shortening cycle versus Tim at a 15.1% gain. So that's a big difference. So 
now I have that confirmation that we have a gorilla and we have a kangaroo. And now what about efficiency? Because again, I have Tim, a kangaroo who relies more on this stretch running cycle versus Pedro. So what I did was I subjected both of them to the 60 jump test on the just jump map. And they pretty much hopped up and down as, as high and fast as they can for 60 jumps. And the just jump map calculates a fatigue index. So the higher the fatigue in index, the less of the drop off. The lower the fatigue index, the greater the drop off. Now you have an elastic athlete versus a more muscular athlete or more rigid athlete. So all Pedro's jumps I'm going to assume are going to be a little bit more of a muscular effort. Because again, he doesn't rely on the stretch shortening cycle nearly as much as Tim does. And, you know, you can see Pedro didn't do so hot on this test. Tim finished up with a 1.08 and Pedro finished up with a 0.83. And these numbers don't mean anything by themselves. It's just a comparison that you can use in between athletes and also comparing an athlete to themselves later on to see if they have improved their fatigue index number on the just jump mat and seeing if they can hold on to that anaerobic power of that 60 jump test. So at the end of this, what we learned is that we have these kangaroos who score greater than the 10% on the Bosco jump test. They have a more of a stretch shortening cycle contribution. They're the thinner rubber bands and they have more elastic potential versus somebody like Pedro, our gorilla, is a much more rigid athlete. He's much more of a muscular contribution to his movements. They're the thicker rubber bands. He's more total force output potential and they score less than the 10%. And I wanted to give a shout out to these guys because I brought them through an hour of jump testing and if anyone has done jump testing, it is exhausting as hell. So thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. And now that we've gotten done with our testing, what hopefully to address next is, okay, now we have this elastic or rigid athlete. So how do we exactly train them? And for that, you just have to tune in next time. All right. Thanks for watching, guys. It's been a pleasure. Take care.